Okay, so you've probably heard of the 2003 drama The Room. It's considered by many to be one of the worst films ever made. Written, produced, directed, and lead acted by first-time filmmaker Tommy Wiseau, it was a box office disappointment when it was first released, but has since earned a large cult following. Many people flocked to see it and sold out midnight screenings across the globe, eager to laugh and mock it for its perceived shortcomings, but what you may not realize is that all these people are wrong. Dead wrong. The Room isn't a bad movie, it's actually a brilliant movie, in fact, it's a masterpiece. <laughs> What a story, Mark. Let's find out why this is a misunderstood masterpiece. Many of the people who criticize The Room complain that its plot is incomprehensible, but it's really very simple. It tells the story of a normal-looking man named Johnny, whose perfect life comes crashing down around him when his future wife Lisa begins having an affair with his best friend Mark. Infidelity is obviously a topic that's ripe for exploration because it hasn't been covered very often, but Wazo doesn't stop there. He populates the film with an interesting assortment of supporting players who bring with them unique perspectives and their own subplots, each one adding a new level of psychological and dramatic depth, while at the same time sticking with and revolving around the main message of the film. For example, take a look at the character of Denny. He represents innocence, the uncorrupted innocence of a child, or college-age adult. Throughout the course of the film, we learn that Denny has actually gotten involved with drugs, personifying the corruption of innocence that goes on in the film. One short scene about taking drugs is all you need to give a character depth. Denny also gives Wiseau the opportunity to show the audience how kind and generous he is. Denny is an orphan boy that Wiseau takes under his wing, which makes the audience like him that much more. I love you, Tommy. Literally every character serves a unique and integral purpose to the story and the overall theme, whether it's Peter, the psychologist who loves Lisa one minute, I don't want to get between you and Lisa, and then hates her five seconds later, she only cares about herself, she can't love anyone, or Michelle and her boyfriend Mike, who point out that chocolate is the symbol of love, Did you, uh, know that chocolate is the symbol of love? symbolizing the voraciousness of sex and the overall gluttony of our consumer society, not to mention the injustice of popular underwear manufacturers that rely on forced child labor. And she's uh, showing everybody the underwears. Wizzo could have filled his movie with one-dimensional cardboard cutouts like most movies, but instead, everyone has an interesting backstory and something that makes us care about them. Some people have a problem with this scene. I got the results of the test back. I definitely have breast cancer. Lisa finds out for the first time that her mother has breast cancer and it's never mentioned again. This is why this film is brilliant. It breaks new storytelling ground. You don't need to follow up on it again. We know that she has breast cancer and that right there adds a sense of vulnerability to her character that remains even after it's casually dismissed. Again, with the depth. Do you see how much depth that is? Do you see? You'll see. You'll all see. As the story progresses and Lisa grows more and more distant from Johnny, she decides to get him drunk one night while eating pizza. She tempts him with a drink. If you love me, you'll drink this. And he accepts. The symbolism here is obvious. Her tempting him with a sinful drink is a clear reference to the Boston Tea Party. But instead of rejecting the cursed beverage and casting it into the sea, Johnny accepts, leading to even greater trouble. How dare you talk to me like that? You should tell me everything. Many have pointed out that this film offers an old-fashioned and misogynistic portrayal of women. Darling, you can't support yourself. <laughs> But I just don't see it. Tell me, what is it about this movie that's sexist to you exactly? Lisa, can, can you clean up here, please? Sure, all the women are conniving strumpets who take advantage of innocent men. Tricky, tricky. And have no problem using all their money. All that shopping wore me out. But let's face it, aren't all women like that in real life? I have him wrapped around my little finger. Well, you should be happy then. I don't know why so many women have a problem with the room. I've cleaned up the kitchen, sweetheart, so you don't have to worry about that. There's really nothing sexist about it, so let's just forget about this and move on. In a few minutes, bitch. As the story progresses and Lisa continues her affair with Mark, she tells her friend Michelle. Now, people love to poke fun at the odd pulsating muscle in Lisa's neck. I'm not sure exactly what that is. I've spent a lot of time around health professionals, but they're mostly mental health professionals, so I'm not really sure. Are you okay? Whatever it is, it could be called the physical manifestation of Lisa's guilt. All that pent-up shame is literally pulsing out of her body. There's other Cronenberg-style body symbolism when Mark shaves his face. Now, I'm not allowed near razor blades, so I don't know too much about shaving, but this is meant to show that Mark is turning over a new leaf. He's trying to be a new man by ending the affair, but unfortunately, the succubus Lisa drags him back down to the fiery pits of doom, seducing him with her bodily sorcery. 
Shortly after the introduction of the shaving subplot, the characters decide to have a quick game of football. They have to taunt Peter to do it, showing that he's more easily persuaded than some of my psychologists, and eventually he gives in. People often wonder why you would play football in such a small area and wearing tuxedos, but as anyone who's ever had their yard time restricted can tell you, playing football in a small area is actually a lot of fun. This could also symbolize the fact that Mark and other characters are playing games with their lives by giving in to their temptations. I gave in to my temptations once. Lisa's malicious adultery begins to have an effect on the other characters as well. Denny starts to realize that something is wrong in this scene, and he's so broken that he sits down on the floor rather than using the perfectly good chair sitting right in front of him. There aren't any chairs in my cell. Thanks to some awesome camera composition, we can't help but notice the pillars that are lining the wall. These are clearly visible in several other scenes, and they serve two basic functions. The first, and most obvious, is to make the set appear more realistic. The second is that the pillars invoke the imagery of Greek tragedies, or better yet, ancient Roman arenas where Johnny and his good nature are sacrificed to the harlot Lisa. And what about the silver spoons in the picture frames? No, it's not because those were the standard pictures that were already in the frame when you buy them in the store. The silver spoon is a clear reference to the first Franco-Prussian War. I have to eat through a straw. Wazo gives us an even deeper glimpse into his creative psyche while discussing the meaning of spoons in this CNN interview with Mark actor Greg Sestero. Okay, what do you have first? What kind of spoon did you have? Plastic or what kind of, what, what kind of spoon I, did you have? I, you know, kind of stuck to the traditional silver spoons. I grew up with a silver spoon. Okay, what, 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 before silver, what was? They loved me. Um, I don't do plastic, so I'd have to go back, way back, I'd have to say wooden spoons. That's correct, the wood spoon. Okay, we never rehearsed this, but you know about it. Now, in today's society, if you look at plastic spoon, look at how far we go, but at the same time, the symbolism to respond to your question is, plastic is very harmful for your, for your, for, for your body. But at the same time, if you look at the plastic, what we made in America, let's say 10 years ago compared to today, two different things. That's right. This film is just layered with subtext. Subtle hints in the background of the set aren't the only things that were going on behind the scenes. The Room broke new ground in its technical aspects, being the first film to shoot simultaneously on 35mm film and digital cameras. They didn't just shoot a few scenes on one and then a few on the other, they actually shot everything with both cameras at once, even going so far as to build a custom camera rig to hold both of them at the same time. This cost a lot of money and is one of the main reasons The Room reportedly cost more than $6 million to make, but that's the cost of perfection. Other filmmakers would have cut their budgets in half by picking one format before shooting, but not Tommy Wiseau. Anything, Anything for, for my, my princess. princess. All that extra camera equipment took a toll on the crew, and the production actually went through three different cinematographers during the six-month shoot as several teams walked off the set. But the end results speak for themselves. <laughs> Members of the crew weren't the only ones who had to be replaced. I had to replace someone once. Tommy was always forced to retool the script when the actor who played Peter abruptly quit the film midway through. A psychologist quit on me once. Peter's unfinished lines were quickly given to another actor who played an all new character named Steven. This is going to pull us all down. Many audiences are perplexed when his character abruptly shows up 10 minutes from the end of the film, but this is the kind of on-your-feet thinking that you're forced to do sometimes, okay? Francis Ford Coppola and William Fredkin went through similar troubles while making their masterpieces Apocalypse Now and Sorcerer, and it's these kinds of hardships that make films more interesting. Now, Tommy Wiseau, because he's a genius, was clearly aware that looking at sets and actors all day would make the film feel a bit claustrophobic, so he opens things up by inserting random shots of scenery around San Francisco. Now, for those of us who have been in confinement for a long time, this is like a breath of fresh air. The fun begins when I get out. He also takes this opportunity to populate the film with real-life people that he found on the street. A lot of movies do this to add a sense of realism, using real people and locations instead of actors, but The Room takes it to new heights. Just take a look at one of the most memorable scenes from the film. Hi. Can I help you? Yeah, can I have a dozen red roses, please? Oh, hi, Johnny. I didn't know it was you. Here you go. That's me. How much is it? It'll be $18. Keep, go. Keep the change. Hi, doggy. You're my favorite customer. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye. Just look at how brilliant that was. That was a real flower shop with a real cashier and a real dog and a real Asian man, not actors, and it just screams realism. I tried to find them. After Johnny learns that Lisa is having an affair with his best friend, we get a gut-wrenching, emotionally powerful climax where he confronts Mark. There's a quick callback to the cheap, cheap, cheap from earlier in the film. Cheap, 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 cheap. Showing that their friendship has now deteriorated into open conflict. After that, Lisa leaves him and Tommy loses control, destroying the apartment that they've built together. 
You see him dry humping her red dress, perhaps indicating that he only ever thought of her as an object, you're all trophies, before ultimately killing himself with the same gun he took from Denny's drug dealer earlier in the film. There are few endings as touching as this, and it leaves a dent on your soul that stays with you through all the shock treatment. Johnny was the perfect man, with the perfect life and perfect friends. Johnny's my best friend. He only ever wanted to take care of those around him. If you need anything, call me anytime, all right? All right. And it all comes crashing down. There's a quote in the trailer, attributed to no one, that points out that this film has the passion of Tennessee Williams, and it clearly does. The Room achieves new heights of depth, drama, and emotion that few films even dare to attempt, and it makes it look effortless and natural in ways that we've never seen before. I think the reason most people hate this film is that it's frankly over their heads. We're used to seeing so much crap in theaters these days that when a genuinely brilliant movie like The Room comes along, it throws us off guard and we don't know what to think. I often stay up at night peering into Tommy's eyes and wondering what I can do to make people see just how brilliant this movie is. I need to show them. I need to show them all. You'll see. He told me to. Tommy told me to do it. Tommy told me to do it. I don't care what the doctors say. Football. Chocolate really is the symbol of love. It's delicious. The doctor shouldn't tell me what to do. Strike a pose, Denny. Do it! I'm not allowed to shave because they say I'm not safe with razors. I'm not safe with razors. I, I, I don't know too much about movies, but I thought this one would be good. They all lied to me. Help me, Peter, why did you leave? I got the results of the test back. They were always doing tests. <laughs> Those aren't the toppings she ordered. She ordered other toppings. Why does she have that pizza? Someone's been stealing my pizza. Kill them, Denny. They stole our pizza. Kill them. Do it. You have to be the one to do it because I'm still locked up in here. There's a straight razor in the bathroom. Well, Claudette. How did you know her name's Claudette? I said, how the fuck did you know her name is Claudette? Anyway, how is your sex life? How is your sex life? Throw him off the roof, Mark. He always tries to play psychologist with us. They're always trying to play psychologist with me. I keep telling them that Johnny's my best friend, but they don't believe me. They tell me he's a character in a movie, and I don't believe them. Johnny's my best friend. Johnny's my best friend. Johnny's my best friend now. How is your sex life, doggy? Doggy's dead. I killed him. I killed him. I threw him off the roof. Come with me, Denny. Come with me, all of you. I'll show you. I'll show you the truth. <laughs> Wait a minute, this is the worst fucking movie ever. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! 